Muy buenos días a todos y todas. Eh, mi nombre es Saskia Flores de Condesan. He estado moderando eh, las charlas que hemos estado teniendo en el seminario web Dinámicas de la Vegetación en los Andes, en escenarios de cambio global. Y estamos hoy en nuestra sexta jornada, la última, eh, para continuar hablando sobre estos temas de dinámicas de vegetación. Eh, antes de empezar con nuestra agenda, eh, quisiera hacerles algunos anuncios importantes. El primero, que tenemos un sitio web eh, expresamente dedicado a compartir la información de las charlas que hemos venido teniendo durante la semana pasada y esta. No solo están las presentaciones de nuestros eh, panelistas, pero también los recursos adicionales que ellos han mencionado en sus charlas, como artículos científicos, videos, artículos divulgativos y otros recursos para profundizar en los temas eh, que hemos venido discutiendo. También en nuestro sitio están los enlaces directos a las charlas eh, que han sido grabadas. Recuerden que estos espacios son retransmitidos en vivo por Facebook. Agradecemos también a quienes nos ven desde ahí. Y también grabados para poder tener los videos en YouTube para futuras consultas o las personas que no han podido acompañarnos en vivo en nuestros espacios. Eh, también en nuestro sitio web encontrarán eh, enlaces directos a la biblioteca a las bibliotecas virtuales de la Red de Bosques Andinos y la Red Gloria Andes, en donde hay repositorios grandes con información muy importante sobre lo que se viene haciendo en temas de investigación en vegetación en más de dos décadas. Eh, antes también de empezar, quisiera eh, nombrar y agradecer a las organizaciones que hicieron posible la realización de este seminario web es la Red de Bosques Andinos, la Red Gloria Andes, el Instituto de Ecología Regional de CONICET de la Universidad de Tucumán, CONDESAN, el Programa Adaptación a las Alturas, COSUDE, el Mountain Research Initiative y Geo Mountains. Hoy día eh, cerramos eh, esta serie de charlas, como les decía, y tenemos un invitado súper especial eh, que será presentado después. Solo quisiera decirles el título de la charla que nos convoca hoy. Eh, está en inglés, es Potentially Useful Larger Scale Datasets for Understanding the Drivers of and Better Predicting Changes in Andean Vegetation, o eh, el uso potencial de grandes eh, eh, sets de datos para entender los impulsores y para predecir mejor los cambios que están sucediendo en la vegetación de los Andes. Eh, antes de presentar a nuestro panelista, quisiera yo darle la palabra eh, a Ricardo Grau, eh, quien como ustedes, algunos de ustedes saben, porque nos han estado acompañando en todas las charlas, Ricardo dio también justo hace una semana, un jueves como este, una charla muy interesante sobre cambios en, en gradientes. Ricardo es ingeniero agrónomo de la Universidad de Tucumán, es PhD en geografía de la Universidad de Colorado y actualmente es profesor de Ecología del Paisaje en la Universidad Nacional de Tucumán. Eh, Ricardo, eh, como siempre, es un honor tenerte a ti y te dejo la palabra para que puedas hacer la presentación de James Thornton, el expositor que tenemos el gusto de tener hoy aquí. Bueno, muchas gracias, Saskia. Me escuchan bien, ¿no? Te escuchamos muy bien. Bien. Bueno, para mí es un, es un gusto presentar a James y agradecerle por su presentación de hoy y también porque James junto a, a Carolina Adler, eh, ambos desde Mountain Research Initiative, fueron muy instrumentales en apoyar eh, desde un principio, ya hace casi un año, esta iniciativa ¿no? y darle el, el impulso inicial. Eh, bueno, James combina una experiencia importante en montañas con una experiencia importante en manejo de datos. Su, su doctorado fue en hidrogeología en Suiza, eh, modelando la física de procesos hidrológicos en terrenos alpinos complejos. ¿no? Creo que cualquiera que escuche esa descripción ya comienza a darse cuenta de que eso eh, seguramente eh, requiere destrezas eh, importantes para analizar la, la complejidad de los procesos biofísicos, luego trabajó en inundaciones y ciclones tropicales, y actualmente coordina 
eh, desde 2020, es decir, por los últimos dos años, coordina e implementa Geo Mountains, que es una iniciativa Geo que busca aumentar la disponibilidad y accesibilidad de eh, una amplia gama de datos relacionado con regiones de montaña y aplicar estas bases de datos a estudios que beneficien los ecosistemas y humanas. Eh, entonces creo que aquí hacemos un switch al inglés. Welcome, James. Thank you very much for, for being here and for sharing your insights and your perceptions and uh, letting us know the potential of all these emerging incredibly important uh, tools and resources. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Ricardo. I hope um, you can hear me well. And greetings from Switzerland, and thank you very much for the introduction. Um, indeed, I'm currently based at the Mountain Research Initiative at the University of Bern, um, where I'm responsible for the coordination of geo mountains, as you've just heard. Um, I apologize that I'm speaking in English. I hope you will all be able to follow me uh, sufficiently well. And the, the topic of my talk is really thinking a little bit beyond the very local or the plot scale um, to, to larger scales. Um, I'll talk for approximately 45 minutes, after which we'll have a few questions and then also 45 minutes of discussion and brainstorming together. So really, I'm not at all an expert in, in your region. Um, I've never really worked extensively um, in the Andes, but I do, uh, as Ricardo mentioned, have a bit of interdisciplinary experience in the mountain systems elsewhere in the world. And um, I've been looking a little bit more into some of the data sets which were available uh, in the Andes recently as part of my role at the Geo, at Geo Mountains. Um, I will share the slides afterwards and uh, we have also a list of papers at the end. Um, so um, just to let you know that this information will all be shared. Um, so, um, as Ricardo uh, briefly mentioned, um, Geo Mountains uh, is an initiative which is seeking to increase the discoverability, accessibility and usability of a wide range of data and information related to mountains around the world. Um, it's an initiative of the Group on Earth Observations, which is headquartered in Geneva, and more specifically, we're a, a network looking at observations and information in mountain environments. As the image on the right tries to show, we seek to um, bring together data providers, data users, and local to global scale policymakers um, to, to exchange data and, and knowledge around um, many different disciplines and their interactions, everything from the atmospheric sciences and cryosphere, biosphere, hydrology, and so on, and trying to do this across the world's mountains. Um, Having hopefully made some of this data, data more easily discoverable and accessible, we then hope to exploit the data for scientific purposes and also for decision making. And more generally, we hope to bring together and connect a large global community uh, to help us um, achieve these objectives. And so hopefully um, the the discussion which we will have today will help advance our efforts in all three of these areas, actually. Um, I should mention that we rely very heavily on our collaborations with, with regional partners such as Condesan, and I'm extremely grateful um, to them for their efforts in having put together this course, uh, which we are supporting. Um, and I would also like to underline the fact that Geo Mountains is a very open and inclusive network and we really welcome contributions from those with relevant interest and experience, especially early career researchers. So during the presentation, um, we will touch on some data sets corresponding to um, many of these different disciplines as we really seek to take a very integrated uh, systems type approach to looking at um, mountain dynamics under change. Um, so as I've already mentioned, um, the idea is really to zoom out a little bit from the plot scale and to stimulate um, some discussion, especially for the, the in-person part of the course, which will take place from next week. Um, I understand that this will be really focusing rather on um, some of the more um, 
you know, detailed and site-specific uh, data. But of course, during the presentations which we've heard so far, which have been on more general topics such as climate change and vegetation dynamics, non-native species and so on, um, some more general data sets will surely have been introduced. And um, so really the aim here is to talk a little bit about um, some of the data sets which may have larger spatial coverage and span uh, different disciplines. So we can really seek to understand a little bit better the interactions um, between the various uh, aspects of mountain systems and vegetation dynamics and vice versa. Some of the specific questions uh, which we want to stimulate discussion ar around are listed here. How can we better understand and attribute changes in Andean vegetation and its uh, consequences to respective drivers? So what is causing uh, changes which we may be observing? How can we most effectively combine in situ or plot scale data with the wealth of spatially distributed earth observation data sets which are now available? Uh, especially from satellite remote sensing, of course. And how can we, um, for instance, upscale or downscale? So how can we work across scales? And how can we generate insights um, in locations beyond um, the places where we're undertaking very intensive measurements in the field to predict, again, vegetation patterns? And more specifically, perhaps, how can we generate um, reliable and robust projections of future vegetation dynamics given how we feel the you know, how, uh, plausible scenarios for how the climate might evolve and also other um, impacts of, of change, such as uh, changing water dynamics or uh, anthropogenic pressures uh, and so on. So just continuing to set the scene a little bit about why we might like to uh, seek to address this question at a slightly larger scale, um, essentially because um, such information is generally speaking um, slightly more relevant for decision making, policy making, and society more generally than, than just as what is going on in a very small small area, of course. Um, having said that, in mountains, um, and it's a characteristic feature of all mountains, we have very strong local scale variability. And it's really important that as we seek to um, look towards larger scales that we don't lose sight of this and we don't overlook the importance of representing any spatial variability which is relevant or important for the types of predictions we're trying to make or the types of decisions we are trying to, to inform. So really there's this scale gap which needs to be bridged somehow uh, between our, our local data and some of these more large scale products or more spatially extensive products which are available. Um, one extremely nice feature of giving the talk in this context is that um, the, the networks which are involved in this series, so Gloria Andes and the Andean um, Forest Network, have sites which are distributed uh, very widely across the, the, the mountain chain, the region. And so I think there could be some really um, very high potential uh, to pool these data sets together in conjunction with other data sets to really um, explore um, the impact of, of various topographic, climatic, geological uh, conditions. Um, so really, I'm sure that you have very valuable data sets to exploit. And um, this can also be further facilitated, hopefully, by introducing um, additional potential covariates. Um, so, yep, we, I'm really talking about the potential to um, combine data sets across multiple disciplines, potentially via data fusion or data integration approaches. Um, and many of these data sets will have um, contrasting spatial and temporal resolutions. Um, in many cases, of course, these different types of data can be very complementary to one another. Um, and I will focus mostly on data today. I won't talk so much about the methods. Um, other people are probably better placed to, to deal with that than me. And as I've alluded to earlier, this is by no means exhaustive. You are really the local experts working day in and day out in the region. And you're probably aware of other data sets, which, um, which I may not be familiar with, but hopefully we can also have a, an exchange and share information. And later we will brainstorm a, a list of data which could augment uh, the data sets, which I will show briefly during my presentation. And we can, of course, discuss the relative strengths and weaknesses 
um, of them and the different requirements for different um, systems or different disciplines. So for instance, the difference in data requirements, perhaps if we're looking at forest versus alpine vegetation. Um, a brief word very quickly on the need for interdisciplinarity. Of course, I'm sure as you are all aware, mountain systems are extremely complex, comprised of many different sub subcomponents. And the figure which I'm showing here just seeks to illustrate that a little bit from a paper which we had last year. And I won't dwell into too many details, but I was just having, in preparation for this uh, talk, I was just having a little bit, look, little look. And I found an example of, of this paper from the 90s. And of course, an appreciation of the, the importance for, for cross-disciplinary uh, links and interactions goes much further back than that. But I just wanted to highlight this abstract because it touches upon a few of the, the multiple influences on high mountain vegetation, for instance, the chemical uh, conditions, drainage characteristics, the aspect of the slopes, the type of soils, the thermal conditions, um, you know, altitudinal levels, of course, um, and winter snow accumulation. So just to illustrate or to underline the fact that there are many different factors at play, and um, these can all affect um, um, vegetation uh, distributions and their dynamics under external forcing. Geo Mountains, as part of our main initiative, is really to trying to bring together um, different data sets from around the world, which are of course obtained and curated by many, many different organizations. And one of the efforts which we are undertaking um, is related to in situ data in particular, and especially for the more research oriented sites. And so we, we released um, last year and have recently updated a little bit an in situ inventory, which tries to pro provide an overview of who is measuring what, when, where, how, and why in the mountains. Um, so it's not constrained just to climate, say, or weather, but really across multiple disciplines, which I've just alluded to. And you can look at this on our, uh, we have a web mapping application, you can download the actual table. And I'm pleased to say that very recently, uh, thanks to Louis Daniel uh, Lambi, we've managed to add many sites uh, in the Andean region, including the sites from Gloria Andes and the Andean Forest Network. And so they are now on there. Um, and essentially we will then seek to continue to improve this, this resource um, you know, over time by adding additional operational sites, for example. And the idea is that you may be able to see um, who else is monitoring uh, in the mountains, perhaps other disciplines which could be relevant um, to vegetation studies in a given region. Um, and I will give a short demonstration uh, probably at, at the end of the talk, just for a moment, just to, to show you the interface and how you can interact with this web map. And there's also the option for um, you all as a global community of, of mountain researchers to contribute to this effort by adding additional sites or improving the information we have around uh, existing sites. Then to complement this, we also have a general inventory which contains gridded data sets largely and also links to data portals. And you can filter this a table, which is again accessible via the Geo Mountains website um, on various different fields, including continents. So you can look at all the data sets which correspond to South America. And so in the context of this talk and this, this question, Many of some of the global scale data sets could be useful, but of course we have to bear in mind the caveat which I mentioned earlier around um, applicability and resolution. And then of course there are also some more local scale data sets which may be even more useful. And again, um, the community can contribute to this resource and um, I will show it uh, briefly in a moment. Just before I really get into the subject of the talk, I just also want to provide some other news from our network. Um, over the past year or two, we've been involved in uh, a few papers which have now been published. And I want to draw attention particularly to this one in the top right, which is um, towards the definition of essential mountain climate variables, which talked a little bit about this need to intelligently integrate in situ data, remotely sensed data, and also potentially modeled data, so model outputs in order to, to maximize their respective benefits and to minimize their respective limitations. Um, and that really fits very well with the philosophy of the remainder of this talk. 
Um, just lastly as well, we've also been conducting um, in collaboration with our regional partners, a series of discussions uh, with stakeholders about data uh, needs, major data gaps, the challenges or the reasons for those data gaps, and some potential solutions across the world's different mountain regions, which we are focusing on under the Adaptation at Altitude program. So trying to understand to what extent the challenges are specific to certain mountain regions or whether they are generic. Um, and so we've had a very successful meeting um, in collaboration with Condesan uh, last year. And now we want to also continue the conversation through this um, series of, of talks uh, and our other activities to try to get even more specific details and exchange even more deeply around the data situation uh, in the Andes and how we can start to now exploit the data which we have available and really have a, an impact on science and uh, policy and so forth. Okay, so I'll now talk a little bit about some um, data sets which, which I'm aware of having sort of developed these, these inventories um, over the past few months. Um, which could provide a starting point for our discussion later. And so I'll present a mixture of both global data sets, which could still be more useful. So global data sets, which could still be useful on a more regional level um, and also more regional and local data sets. Um, not all are currently in our inventory, just to let you know that, but of course, um, these can be added in due course. Um, so the first type of data I wanted to briefly mention is mountain delineations. How do we identify where um, mountains are, or where, what is a mountain, what is not a mountain, um, of course, in the South American context uh, here. And so one potential data source you might like to take a look at is the uh, Global Mountain Explorer, which is taken care of by the US Geological Survey, the USGS, in collaboration with, with Geo Mountains and others. And this provides um, three alternative um, delineations of mountains for download. And so you may like to work with these. You may already have your, your mountain delineations. And that's fine, because these are essentially um, quite arbitrary in many ways. But the three very commonly used ones, um, interestingly, actually, have quite contrasting spatial extents. So which one you pick could make a difference to your analysis uh, in some cases. And that was certainly the case in a population study which we recently uh, completed. But that's just um, some very fundamental data. Of course, in mountains, everything is really underpinned by very complex and steep topography. So digital elevation data are very important and are changing all the time. Um, one, um, relatively uh, new data set is called FabDem, which is developed by the University of Bristol. And this is a terrain model at um, 30 meters resolution at the equator. And importantly, it's had the, any buildings and tree, trees removed. So it can be considered a bare earth uh, DEM. And so this could be useful, um, for instance, for providing a framework if we're then trying to generate, for instance, spatial predictions using species distribution models um, you know, across continuously in space away from the, the sites of the plots where we have in situ data. Um, and so on the basis of such a terrain model, one can, of course, compute various derived metrics such as a slope, um, ruggedness, and so forth um, using yeah, geospatial uh, computation algorithms. Alternatively, one can use um, pre-computed um, terrain derivatives. So I wanted to draw attention to this data set, which is called Geomorpho 90. And there was a publication in Scientific Data a couple of years ago, where um, they used a terrain model at slightly lower resolution, around 90 meters. Um, but they essentially pre-computed 26 or so of these um, geomorphometric variables, and they're listed in the table on the right. And so this, these could provide potential covariate data for, for spatial models of, of vegetation uh, and species and really provide this consistent basis for extrapolating uh, in space. And this data is all freely available. Of course, we have to think about um, climate being, of course, a key control on vegetation uh, dynamics. And so um, there are, of course, uh, a, a very wide 
uh, array of data sets out there on temperature, precipitation, and so forth. I wanted to draw attention to, to this data set initially. Um, I'm not sure how one should pronounce it, PB core perhaps, um, because um, this is a global data set, um, at relatively high resolution, but only monthly frequency. But it's interesting because it accounts for this uh, challenge in the mountains that um, many gridded data sets severely underestimate mountain precipitation. And uh, this is likely um, in large part because of the undercatch problem, the fact that our typical precipitation gauges don't catch all of the precipitation which falls, especially when it's very snowy or very windy. And so this um, data set proposes a set of corrections to very commonly used climatologies such as the World Clim or Chelsea data sets, which many of you may be familiar with. So that could also be a potentially relevant uh, data set. On a more uh, continental basis, um, there's the LATAM data set, which is for precipitation, which has conversely a rather coarse spatial resolution, that is daily frequency. And on the right-hand side, we see the density of stations which are actually informing the product, uh, these black dots. And we actually see that they are quite low over the mountain region. And so this is just to flag that um, it could be very useful to check that uh, where possible. So um, when we have gridded data sets, also to seek to go back and understand the actual observational networks on which they are based. Um, and ideally, of course, these gridded data sets should come with some uncertainty estimates, which sort of reflect the station coverage at each time step, ideally, but not all do at the moment. Um, on an even sort of higher resolution, more national scale, we have the CR2 MET data set from, for Chile, which covers Chile. And this is temperature and precipitation, um, 0.05 degree uh, resolution grid and available at both, both daily and monthly frequencies. And so yeah, from these three examples, which I just presented, we sort of see the trade-offs which often have to be made between say spatial coverage, temporal res uh, spatial, spatial coverage and resolution and, and temporal frequency. So often we have to sort of compromise depending on the aims of our study and the scale of our, of our investigations. And then as we're looking into future scenarios, of course, we have um, regional climate models. And for the South American um, region, we have um, a regional domain of, of Cordex, which provides um, many um, GCM, RCM model chain, chains to give a, a perspective of um, how the future climate may evolve and the various um, uh, concentration pathways, emissions scenarios, and so forth. Um, but of course, um, you know, these regional climate models are much higher resolution than the global climate models, but of course, they are still not necessarily as high resolution as we would like for very local and detailed mountain studies. So again, there's this scale gap to be bridged. Um, start to introduce a little bit more around um, well, continuing on the climatological theme, but also um, a little bit of um, hydrology as well. There was this very nice uh, paper, which some of you, many of you perhaps will be familiar with from uh, Thomas Condon, published two years ago now in Frontiers in Earth Science. And this is a very nice overview of quite a range of data sets which are available um, for the entire uh, South American Andes related to climate and hydrology. So I would definitely encourage you to, to take a look at this paper and the data sets which are mentioned if you haven't done so already. And this work was conducted within the framework of the ANDEX program. Um, and yet, I also just wanted the reference here, um, Corveda et al. 2020, provide some data specifically on hydroclimatic extremes because um, vegetation, is not only dependent upon sort of mean climate, but also actually can be very strongly affected by extremes in climate, whether that be heat waves, droughts, um, fires, floods, uh, and so forth. So it's also just to think on these different um, probability levels, I suppose, and the climate distribution and how they um, are arranged in space and time and how they might also change in the future scenarios. 
Um, of course, mountain vegetation in particular, um, you know, the really important aspect is the, the climate at the very, very local scale. So the climate which, uh, for instance, uh, an individual plant experiences. And so an effort to better understand this is the soil temp network, which has really been led um, very much by Jonas Lembrecht for several years now. And really this is trying to pool together um, data sets from low cost sensors um, for soil temperature measurements, um, as the name suggests, and bring them together into a larger um, analysis. So potentially this, um, this data set could also be useful for pooling in with the data sets from the Andean networks um, you know, to include in the analysis essentially. Um, and Geomountains, we're actually currently working with soil temp team to improve their database in the back end and hopefully eventually publish this data set openly. Um, so yeah, soil temp is a very nice, nice initiative, really trying to represent these very local scale variabilities, um, but also on a, on a larger scale. So trying to bridge this gap as well. And there are already some products uh, arising from this effort, such as some global soil temperature maps, which were published last year, and which um, even if they don't um, contain many data points from the Andean region, as you can see on the top there, um, they could still potentially um, be useful as predictors or as covariates in uh, species distribution models, for instance, um, at, a, at a more large scale. Moving on to consider evapotranspiration, which really acts as a link between the hydrological cycle, the energy cycle, the atmosphere, of course, um, and you know, vegetation is really the key um, modulator um, of this process. Um, and a challenge is um, that often evapotranspiration estimates, gridded ET estimates, are often very variable. They don't agree very much with one another, depending on the data sets and the methods which were used. And so this uh, product, um, which was published in Earth System Science Data, recently, and we have a link there, um, sought to combine several existing products into a sort of blended product um, at one kilometer resolution. So this could again potentially be useful for, for understanding some of these larger scale dynamics and relating the local scale data you have to, um, to some of these um, yeah, processes which, which operate across the, the Earth system and which link the, the land surface with the atmosphere, for example. And on a similar theme, I wanted to briefly mention soil moisture, which again is really a very strong determinant of, of vegetation um, species and, and patterns and so forth. And the challenge here when we try to move to a larger scale is essentially that um, from, from satellites, um, the information which we can get on soil moisture is extremely coarse in resolution and is probably still not suitable to my understanding for applications in, in mountain terrain. So that's a challenge we have. Of course, we can measure soil moisture on the point scale. Maybe we can also estimate it on over very small areas using drones, for instance, the same with evapotranspiration. But um, beyond that, there's really this scale gap as well. Um, so that's at least my impression. And we can, of course, discuss this, whether this is really the case or not um, later on. Um, land cover, of course, there are a growing number of sources of land cover data now available. Um, one which I think is, is especially promising is the, um, the worldwide, um, sorry, the world cover data from the European Space Agency, which is provided now at 10 meter resolution based on Sentinel data. Um, and there are, there are several others. I know Google has a data set which seems to be a little bit more dy dynamic in time as well. And so this could again potentially be deployed as a covariant. Um, in, in predictive models, in spatial models, or conversely, the, the local data could be used to sort of evaluate this product and actually see how well it corresponds in the regions where we have our field measurements, we have our plots. Um, does, the, does the world cover data actually do a good job or does it not for whatever reason? So this can really work in both ways as well. And so I want to also emphasize this exchange that the local knowledge and information should also ideally feed back up into some of these 
um, more global or large scale products. Um, mm -hmm. Turning our attention now to the cryosphere and snow data, um, we have from the European Space Agency again, uh, a relatively new or updated product, which is the snow CCI data set. And this provides um, snow cover information in specifically on a one kilometer grid uh, resolution and on daily time step, um, the fractional snow cover on the ground from MODIS data covering 20 year period, so quite a good period. Um, and although there are some gaps uh, in, in the, the data set due to cloud cover, this is kind of a potentially a nice product for understanding some of the snow dynamics and the differences across the, the elevational and latitudinal range of uh, the, the, the Andean sites where you're monitoring uh, the vegetation and the forests. And there are um, as I mentioned, some gaps due to clouds, and also there's a product which is snow water equivalent, um, but actually that the mountainous areas are masked out of that data set. The algorithm doesn't really work very well um, in mountainous areas, but that's potentially less relevant for vegetation than, say, for, for hydrology. On a more um, regional and local level, I came across um, this new website recently, the Observ Snow Observatory. Uh, for the Andes of Argentina and Chile. And this provides a sort of dashboard for looking at um, real-time spatial uh, and temporal snow information. And on this site, you can, for instance, click on different basins and look at these maps and so forth and can compare the actual situation to longer-term uh, means and so forth. One thing I'm not sure um, about this at the moment, and it, this also applies to some of these other um, websites and resources is that I'm not sure if one can actually download the uh, the data which is shown and then work with it, um, as in, you know, can we access the underlying data? And so it may be necessary to contact them and, and ask, um, but I think it's still positive that more and more organizations are seeking to show and illustrate their data in a very user-friendly way. And this is great for for decision makers and policy makers, but as scientists, we also need to be able to access the actual data and put it into our models and our algorithms and so forth. Um, so this is just a, an additional um, challenge. Um, and then for, for glaciers, we have these standard data sets, which I suppose many of you will be familiar with already, um, providing information on, on glacier extents, such as the, the World Glacier Monitoring Service, the Randolph Glacier Inventory, uh, and so on and so forth, um, glacier extent and mass balance. And the link with vegetation, I suppose, is a little bit more in terms of um, can we include this data in some kind of proxy measure for, for how hydrology could change, especially where we have systems which are very highly dependent on, um, on glacier melt. Um, and yeah, we can also consider, of course, future glacier um, evolution scenarios in terms of extent and mass balance um, on the one hand because this will open up new habitats for especially alpine species to colonize and to to move into and then again um, in terms of the water availability outlook for for say groundwater dependent ecosystems and wetlands and things like this um, so that's a word on on ice permafrost as well there are um, of course, interactions um, between mountain alpine vegetation and permafrost, and some of my colleagues have been working on this in the Alps in very, very much detail. Um, and from this, I understand that uh, mountain permafrost is rather difficult to characterize or to map accurately at high resolution, um, but it can be an important covariate in, in, in species distribution models, and um, I'm not sure to what it is to what extent uh, this is really relevant for your sites, but probably some of the, the glorious sites, um, potentially it could be. And um, it's especially difficult to map permafrost occurrence or probability in unconsolidated sediments rather than in, in bedrock, in cliffs and rock walls where actually the, the ground temperature follows much more directly the air temperature. These interactions can be much more complex in, in unconsolidated sediments. So that's just something to potentially bear in mind. And uh, consequently, um, the data products on permafrost are generally rather more local or regional scale. There is, however, 
uh, this data set, the permafrost probability fraction, um, which covers the, the Andes, the complete uh, chain at one kilometer spatial resolution. So whether this is useful or not, uh, one would have to uh, evaluate. And at a more local scale, there's a couple of examples here. Uh, there's a favorability map um, for part of the semi-arid Chilean Andes and also for the San Juan dry Andes in Argentina. A couple of examples with references there, but I won't go into too much detail um, on the permafrost. And on hydrology, I suppose the discipline with which I am a little bit more familiar, um, there's quite a nice initiative now, which is called CAMELS. And in particular, there's a, a subset of CAMELS for Chile, which provides um, stream flow data at many gauging stations, uh, which can be downloaded and also provides physical descriptors or catchment attributes of the, the associated catchments. So this is sort of similar uh, to the global runoff data center, which of course also provides stream flow data, um, but without so much the, uh, the catchment descriptors. And of course, there's data from um, you know, national and local um, monitoring agencies. Um, much hydrological observation is done by these authorities in the different countries and in the different regions as well. I'm not sure to what extent it could be useful, but there is, of course, um, as you will be aware, forest and vegetation data on, on larger scales, which is available. So for instance, via the Global Forest Watch, we can um, look again via a kind of dashboard on um, tree cover loss through time. Um, and many other um, forest variables can be visualized. For instance, the tree cover height, um, fire areas or burned areas and so forth. Again, I'm not sure how easy it is to access the underlying data here, but one could inquire with the, um, with the Global Forest Watch. And here, I suppose the, the idea could be to, to link the plot scale data observations of, of local forest change with broader patterns. Again, this downscaling um, of the more regional or continental or even global data sets based on the knowledge from the actual uh, sites. Another example is the Restore initiative, which is um, set up from the ETH in Zurich, the lab of um, Thomas Crowder, Professor Thomas Crowder. And this is an effort to connect nature conservation and restoration efforts with one another, but also with various data sources and funding sources on a global basis. And on the right-hand side on their dashboard, you can see that they also offer the possibility to visualize a range of potential covariate data or climatic or environmental data um, but again, it's unclear whether the data can be actually accessed or downloaded from this portal. However, what you can do is you can draw a, a, a polygon essentially on this website and you can obtain some summary statistics from these data sets over a particular region of interest. So that could be um, of relevance. And then of course, um, on this theme, there's, there's optical remote sensing products from, from Landsat, from Sentinel, increasingly also from the private sector from for example, planet, planet Labs, they also provide um, yeah, optical um, remote sensing images at increasingly high resolution, which can then be applied for assessing these ecosystem dynamics and, and changes through time um, to vegetation and, and ecosystems. Of course, um, soils are, are rather crucial for, uh, for forest and vegetation. And my experience, even in Switzerland, is that it's very, very hard to obtain good information on soil properties, even very basic soil properties like depth, physical uh, characteristics, and so forth. I think this situation is definitely improving, however. For example, we now have the Soil Grids Initiative, which is global scale effort providing soil maps at 250 meter spatial resolution. And uh, I'm showing here, um, their classification of soil types, but they also provide data set on various uh, physical and chemical soil properties, which again could be integrated as covariates or predictors into some of these spatial uh, models. Um, and these data can be downloaded, so that's, uh, that's the good news. Um, of course, higher resolution soil maps may be available for smaller regions, but it's very much a patchwork if they don't follow the same 
um, classification schemes and things, and it's a large effort to try to to homogenize them or to um, to integrate them together. Ten minutes left. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think I'm more or less on time. Okay. Um, in yeah. terms of bedrock geology, probably even more challenging. Um, again, from my experience, I, this was an, an important factor in my previous work. Um, but again, there are large scale data sets available. And I think geology is very relevant insofar as it then controls the soil properties and also hydrological conditions at or near the surface for, for vegetation. And there's definitely this strong interdependency between hydrology and vegetation, of course. Um, so I'm showing here, for instance, a continental scale a geological map provided by the USGS. Um, and then there's again, some more specific um, geological maps available, just showing a couple here, for example. Um, but again, they don't have this constant classification scheme and furthermore often require some manual georeferencing. Um, I guess it would be important in any kind of spatial extrapolations to account for things like environmental protection legislation, protected areas. Um, so one could, for instance, look at the protected uh, the World Database on, on Protected Areas, um, WDPA, via the Protected Planet website. Um, and through the MRI in collaboration with UNESCO, we also recently relaunched the World Network of Biosphere, of Mountain Biosphere Reserves. But of course, we have to think, um, just because we, we say on a piece of paper that an area is, is protected, we have to think whether that's really the case in reality. And I just point, point uh, out to you this paper from uh, PNAS recently, which was basically saying that many international treaties, including environmental treaties, um, you know, have actually failed and not implemented effectively to meet their intended obligations and, and, uh, and needs. So that's again, something to potentially um, consider perhaps. And um, increasingly, we have to think of mountain systems as not only the biophysical aspect, but also the societal or socioeconomic aspects. And this is definitely a, a growing area of interest for geo mountains. Um, and so we're currently working on a project to identify which variables or indicators we need to use or to obtain to characterize this component of mountain systems. We've done some work on human, human populations, which I alluded to before. And there's some new data from the European Commission on, on population. And you probably can't see the map very well, but this is a region around um, um, Tuikan, if I pronounce that correctly, <laughs> um, from this very high, more high resolution data on populations and there's various other data sets, urbanization, extents, and things. And of course, this is relevant um, in terms of the pressure that human um, activities can exert on, on mountain ecosystems. I'm coming very much towards the end now. Um, save maybe a, a short demonstration of the inventories. I wanted to just show you and make you aware of the Geo Knowledge Hub. And this is really an effort to go from data um, and scientific papers to actually implementable knowledge. And so the idea is that um, you can upload complete knowledge packages, reproducible and transparent workflows comprising not only, for instance, a paper, but also the code, the input data sets, the output data sets, so that other people can then reproduce it and maybe uh, modify it and apply it elsewhere or to a different region or, or so on. So this is definitely something we're supportive of. And perhaps in the analysis phase of the, the training course, um, if, for instance, some uh, code is written, which is then uh, eventually published as part of a paper. If this could also be presented as a knowledge package, that would also be, be great. And it's really also around building trust from the users of scientific information in the science. Can they really reproduce uh, what, what we've done and is it transparent and everything? So this is very important, increasingly also for, from funders and, and other organizations. So with that, I would just briefly break off from the um, break off from the presentation. And if I can just swap the um, swap this, the screen share and just show you very briefly these uh, these inventories just in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so for instance, this is the um, this is the in situ inventory which we have. And uh, as one zooms in, these these blue dots are all of the other sites. Um, and as one zooms in, uh, increasing um, an increasing number of sites um, render themselves and resolve. And essentially, um, we can have some different options for changing the base maps up here. 
Um, and we can also search by um, individual. James, we're not seeing the, your screen now. Are you not? Maybe I think I'll... you have to stop sharing your screen and then select um, uh, okay. the web page you want to share. Okay, I'll try again. So now, now do you see? Yes. Yes. Okay, apologies for that. So you missed uh, this a little bit. But essentially, I was just saying that this is the, the Geo Mountains uh, global in situ inventory. And I was just uh, showing that you know we have these different base maps and one can zoom in um, and the, the sites uh, resolve themselves. These are largely the ones which I added, added thanks to, to you, Lewis, Danielle. And you can click on an individual site and get a set of attributes, uh, metadata for that site, including the contact information of the person responsible, what kind of data are measured there, um, which organizations are involved and so forth, and potentially also um, publications which are associated or, um, or accessing the data even if the data are provided. So we think this is really a, an important initiative to develop this global overview of who's measuring what in situ. And then for the more general inventory, this is the table which we have at the moment and uh, which I was mentioning, you can filter on various attributes and again, which is downloadable. Uh, here you can download everything um, and you can filter again, for instance, by continent, we can look uh, South America and then we can, can see what resources we have in there and maybe even click through on the, on the URL and access uh, some of these data sets and portals um, directly. This is one which is uh, coming from Condesan. Um, so that's just a very brief um, demonstration of uh, the inventories, and I'd really encourage you, if you have additional sites or data sets to add, um, then please do so. Um, I will briefly conclude this part of the talk um, by saying that, um, just bear with me a second, just by saying that a considerable amount of uh, cross-disciplinary data um, obviously exists in the region. Um, but it's really in many different formats for different time periods, resolutions, and the challenge is how to, to combine it. Um, I definitely encourage you to think of ways which we can bridge this gap and integrate the in-situ data with some of these uh, broader scale data sets to, to yield more decision relevant uh, predictions and insights and where possible to try to uh, follow these open science uh, and open data principles. Um, so I have a set of uh, papers and things, some of which I've been reading and preparing this presentation, some of which just provide more general uh, examples of applications of some of the data sets and some which point to other data sets which I've not mentioned. So uh, once I provide the slides, then you'll also be able to, to have a look at uh, these papers if you're not familiar with them already. Um, and with that, maybe we can move on to uh, the, the questions and also then the more brainstorming type of activities and discussion. Uh, afterwards. So back to you, uh, Saskia, please. Thank you very much, James. Thank you for such a great talk. Muchas gracias, James, por tu presentación. Um, shall we start with the discussion upon your questions? Um, yes, I'm happy to either take general questions on the talk or to start the discussion. Um, I think it would be better if we start with general questions first. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Mejor empezar con preguntas generales de, de ustedes de la audiencia y las podemos traducir, ¿sí? Perfecto. Empezamos nuestro espacio de preguntas y respuestas. Les pido, por favor, que alcen la mano o que las escriban en el chat. Iremos dando la palabra en orden. La pregunta puede ser puesta en español eh, y Luis Daniel nos ayudará con la traducción simultánea eh, si, eh, al inglés si es necesario. Entonces, Lirey y, y luego Gustavo, por favor. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, more than a question, I well, I just wanted to maybe contribute with uh, another uh, data so database that is in building. Uh, right now, I'm working with Mike Abader here in Marburg, and she's trying to develop a data set about alpine tree lines. So I will just share the the link in into the chat. So you can just add it to your, yeah. your very beautiful uh, uh, yes, data series of, uh, yeah, of data sets that you already have. 
Yeah, thank you very much. And this is almost preempting also, I think, part of the, the brainstorming session, which would also have been, which will also be sort of invitation to all the participants who are joining today also to fill in a, a spreadsheet, interactive spreadsheet, which I've set up um, listing these data sets. So yeah, by all means, put it in the uh, the chat. I think I'm familiar actually with the Alpine Tree Lines uh, network from, this is from Mike um, yeah, yeah. in uh, Marburg. Yeah, yeah, so we're familiar yeah, with yeah, this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this sure. is good. I don't know uh, if, if you if you saw her. We had a a, a poster in uh, in the International Mountain Conference. Uh, I yeah, don't yeah. Know. This is this is good. And I was actually at a workshop um, earlier with in the summer where we were talking a little bit about this uh, topic as well. Oh. So yeah, this is this is great. Thank you very much. And, great. Uh, we'll no, thank you. That. Yeah. Thanks. Muchas gracias, Lirey. Thank you, James. Seguimos con Gustavo, por favor. Mm -hmm. Eh, buenos días, eh, si ¿sí me escuchan. Te escuchamos perfecto. Perfecto. Um, eh, James, uh, first, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It was a, a real great tour uh, around all the services that are available right now. And uh, my question is uh, about the standards used to share information. Um, we already know, know that we have standards like the, uh, the Darwin Core, or uh, we have uh, uh, meta, uh, standards for multimedia metadata and uh, to share some ecological data. But one of the main problems when you want to make a research is that you get a lot of information in the form or, of CSV data or uh, even SQL data. Um, but when you're trying to process the information, the lack of standards make it really difficult to work. I wonder if, um, in the systems that we are creating to keep track of um, a multivariate data. I mean, uh, ecological data can be uh, processed uh, about climate, about biodiversity, about uh, lots of things. Um, is there any way to handle all this data using a standard or something that uh, give us a, a chance for not to have to map all the data from one format to another, how you handle it? How, is, is there a way to do that? Is there a service that can do that? Thanks. Thank you very much, Gustavo, for the question and for the, the comment also. Um, I think, yeah, you touch on a real challenge, actually. Um, and it's not so, it's increasingly within a certain discipline or within a certain broad area, we're now having these, these standards, as you say, the Darwin core or uh, standards for sharing and exchanging climatological data. The real challenge is when we're thinking about these integrated system type approaches, how to do that across different disciplines, given how contrasting the data formats are. And we're also experiencing this now, trying to integrate more societal data where you know, we have data which is aggregated to political boundaries, and we're talking about disaggregation and things to, to, to spatial units. So I think it's a real challenge. I think one positive development is something called Stack, which you may uh, have come across, which is essentially an open source um, yeah, approach or, or system for, for describing geospatial data, it can be um, gridded data, data cubes, but also in situ data. And I'll try to find the, um, I'll try to find the link so I can share it in the chat. Um, and this could essentially be um, the sort of the system which everybody converges on, but definitely the problem at the moment is that um, people are really using different uh, different systems which don't necessarily, or different metadata standards, even machine readable metadata standards, which don't necessarily talk to one another. And this is something which is really a problem. And for instance, the Group on Earth Observations has a, a portal called the GEOS portal. And this was developed um, several years ago now. And at that time, the role of this essentially was to um, be able to convert all of data sets, the metadata described in these different standards into something standards and, and consistent so that people could, could search for them. But it um, increasingly, I think, as we are hopefully going to see some of these uh, more popular and more modern ones emerge, then hopefully the community will, will shift en masse to one and won't be split across uh, split across many. But it's a very difficult, difficult area. And of course, the, the 
technological landscape is evolving rapidly and we are just a small sort of player in this um in this space of course you have the private sector companies and everything involved and your googles and amazon and, and microsoft so um yeah hopefully we will see greater um tendencies towards uh we have consistent uh, approaches for describing geospatial data, which allows them this interoperability and um, we can have databases which talk to one another and as one is updated, this is automatically reflected in elsewhere and so on. Um, but thank you for the question. I'd be happy to also discuss this uh, further uh, later on as well. Well, uh, I just wanted to make a, um, a last, just a, just a comment. Uh, we've seen such a wide variety of, uh, of sources of information that I think that it would be very useful to have some sort of a, of a directory of uh, um, information sources. And that's something that maybe we can work with uh, with Condesan one of these days and uh, build a database of uh, information sources for uh, environmental uh, uh, services. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's that's absolutely what we're trying to do in uh, in Geo Mountains, also in collaboration with Condesan, very much through the adaptation of altitude program. Trying to provide this this umbrella, I suppose, of uh, all the different data portals and different data sets which exist, and uh, just make it more efficient for for individual researchers to find what they're looking for and to get put through to the data and start to use it. So, yeah, we're definitely on the same page here. Thank you very much, Gustavo. Thank you, James. Are there more questions maybe? I had a, a question for James. Um, yeah, one, one of the issues that we have is, is, is the problem of, of scale that you mentioned and downscaling, you know, when you have point data, for example, in Gloria, we have 17 regions and in, inside each region, you can have two, uh, uh, three or four summits. Uh, and then, you know, you're comparing these different uh, 17 sites across the Andes uh, but when we have tried, for example, to use uh, climate data uh, to try to apply it to the site, you find that the, the, there is a huge gap between what, what is reported in global databases and what is actually measured uh, from the stations that you know locally. Yeah. Uh, and this can be, uh, you know, such a big gap that, that then, you know, for example, it has, it has, you know, for me at least, uh, it has removed confidence in trying to use global products to understand local dynamics because you know you if you move one kilometer uh, from one summit to another precipitation can change you know 300 millimeters and this is not irrelevant for understanding vegetation dynamics and the same can happen uh, where more complex processes it can be even worse so my question is uh, how do you deal with uncertainty you know in in, in the, because of some of these products are provide you with a way of, of, you know, of dealing with this uncertainty and, uh, and also how can we use the data that we have from, from these networks to, to improve these products, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is yeah, a really important question and something which I've also experienced in my own work in the Swiss Alps. Again, you know, we're talking about, for instance, precipitation and we're, we're missing like 50% of the precipitation and stuff like this. It's really substantial also for hydrological applications. And I suppose, the argument would be that you know we have to somehow generate spatial predictions beyond the sites where we're monitoring intensively and maybe like we need to really develop some kind of um, mapping function or association even if you know even if in absolute terms the gridded global data products you know, don't get the absolute values um, at the sites correct it's about how do we combine these data sets together and essentially rescale a little bit the, the large scale products, which is very similar to this, um, this precipitation data set, which I mentioned, um, the piece, uh, the, the one where they um, adjust the, the climatologies to account for this under, under catch effect, really about associating um, maybe the spatial patterns in the, in the larger scale data sets are reasonable, but the absolute values are not. So can we somehow scale um, them so that they are more relevant for, for more local scale um, applications, you know, at the scales which we're interested in when we're talking about uh, mountain vegetation, but it's not straightforward. And of course, then the other way around about how can we feed um, these data sets in. Um, we're working quite a bit with the WMO, for instance, and at the moment they of course have this operational um, exchange 
program set up for, for operational climate stations, but much less so for research oriented sites. And many research oriented sites may not be monitoring to the same standards as, as for instance, operational sites, but they nevertheless provide useful information, even if it's more uncertain and so forth. So it's really about how do we integrate um, these, um, these more research oriented sites, which is very much why we developed also the in-situ inventory to try to get an overview of where these actually are into these global products, because my impression at the moment is that they are just neglected. And that's why when you zoom in in the global product to a, to a location where you have a station, what you get is, is junk. It's because that's not integrated into the, the interpolation algorithm or whatever. So I think this is something definitely maybe through the reach of, of the MRI and GM mountains, we can try to have these discussions also with the developers of these gridded products and say, hey, look, there's also this wealth of, um, of, of data from the research community, which at the moment is rather ignored in these products and uh, see how we can um, integrate it together. And this is again why we need the common standards and everything and uh, ideally also common protocols for, for instrumentation, measurement and data storage and processing and so on and so forth. So it's by no means straightforward, but um, I think that's really got to be the way we go about it and trying to bridge the, um, bridge the gap a little bit there. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot. And I mean, just to add, I mean, um, it could be that we really have to really as a community demonstrate the value of these data sets, right? So for example, um, I talked about the WMO and the forecasting, you know, the, the, the weather forecasting centers like ECMWF or whatever, we could actually have some experiments where we seek to integrate uh, this research mountain data and see to what extent it improves the weather forecasts or the, the short term uh, flood forecasts and things like this. And then you can actually quantify the benefit of, of sharing this data, because until we do that, probably they may not take so much notice. Um, but if you can quantify it, then, then this could also be promising and run these sort of numerical experiments showing the potential value um, of, of also integrating this additional data from, from these networks, more research led networks. Um, and lastly, yeah, I guess the, the possibilities of new new data driven algorithms. I've not really talked about them, but machine learning and um, you know, deep learning and everything. In theory, you can throw all these data sets together, and um, these algorithms will find the patterns and the interact the associations. And um, we don't necessarily have to use these traditional statistical methods anymore as well. Uh, that's just another another reflection. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the question and. Uh, yeah, for your continued collaboration. Thank you, Liz Daniel. Thank you, James. Ricardo, please go ahead with your question. Thanks. And then, I don't know, maybe this will serve as a, as a bridge to the discussion or brainstorming session, but what I see is, I mean, you mentioned that even in Switzerland, there are huge uncertainties to deal with topography which makes me think that, I mean, there is no hope for the Andes. If in Switzerland have huge uncertainties, there is no way that the Andean countries will have a nearly representative database on, on, on weather stations, on, on, on river measurements, and in many other variables in the next, I know, two, three, five decades. I mean, there is no way to do that. So I, I, I was thinking on alternative me methods. And I mean, if the end is to supply information that is useful for decision making and for people, what do you think about the use of citizen science of information taking from, I don't know, cell phones on agriculture yield on, on, on water resources, whatever. How can this be used to fill this gap that will not be filled with new gorges, new weather stations, whatever? Yeah, thanks, Navakade. I think this is um, yeah, also a very important point and important question. I think there are two sides to it. I think firstly, over the last few decades, we've seen a massive revolution and massive advancement in, in of course remote sensing satellite remote sensing and, and drones and so forth so this has already enabled us to um, to characterize many aspects of, of even very remote um, and inhospitable mountain environments much much better than we did before but of course uh, you know remote sensing doesn't tell us everything there are some variables which simply uh, we cannot derive from from remote sensing for instance uh, 
flow in, in smaller streams or, or ground temperatures, things like this. So uh, in this case, um, or even, even snow water equivalent, as I mentioned earlier. So I think in this case, absolutely, citizen science, I think, has a key role uh, in helping to fill the gaps. And of course, the technological um, revolutions and advancements can really help us with this. I think the challenge is how to encourage or to communicate the value uh, of this to the actual citizen scientists themselves. If you're going out for a nice walk in the mountain, why should you bother to stop and you know, take a picture of the vegetation or to measure something or whatever? And um, I think a nice example here to give is um, the Community Snow Observations Project from North America. And they essentially um, try to assimilate um, snow depth observations from citizens again to try to fill the gaps between the, the stations and they run snow models and they actually provide on their website this quantification of the benefit a little bit as i was alluding to earlier in response to the previous question they try to quantify the benefits of the the extra benefit of the additional observations so that if you're a citizen scientist you can actually go on there and you can see that actually your data which you've contributed has actually had a positive effect on and actually being able to quantify the snowpack uh, in, in very remote mountains. So I think this is great because often I think citizen science is like a one-way street, right? The scientists put up some, some sign or they have some system, but then it doesn't feed back to the users and or sorry, to the to the people who contribute the data. And the people who contribute the data don't necessarily see the value or the benefit of, of what they've contributed. So um, I think, yeah, it's definitely going to be a key growing area. And it's again, how do we incentivize and how do we encourage people to, to actually uh, get engaged with this process. Thanks. Thank, thank you, James. Thank you, Ricardo. Si no hay más preguntas, vamos a pasar a esta sección de lluvia de ideas y de discusión que ha preparado James. Gustavo, yo tenía un comentario sobre el comentario de Gustavo. Uh -huh. Adelante. Sí, solamente informar rápidamente que eh, en Condesan hemos hecho un esfuerzo de, de generar una plataforma de indicadores socioambientales. De hecho, tuvimos un taller eh, a, a, ayer, eh, antier, ayer, <ríe> eh, sobre, sobre la plataforma eh, y quizás ahí SAS después les puede copiar el enlace en el, en el chat. Eh, y la idea es, es reunir, eh, hasta ahora tenemos 20 indicadores eh, a partir de datos de Gloria Andes, de la red de bosques andinos, pero también de muchas eh, bases de datos globales y hacer el corte para los Andes eh, a nivel de grandes paisajes. Es decir, ahí están, eh, el corte se hace de qué es andino, eh, definiendo bosques andinos, eh, arbustales, eh, pastizales y glaciares. Eh, y, y por supuesto, entonces la elevación de los Andes varía a lo largo del continente. Y después en algunos casos se presenta la información a nivel nacional o a nivel eh, subnacional, eh, dependiendo del indicador. Eh, y creo que ahí tenemos mucho para, para hacer en conjunto con, con Geo Mountains y, y, con, y con el MRI eh, para seguir sumando indicadores y para integrarlo. Eh, James, I was just uh, telling yeah, Gustavo about his I understood, yeah. comment. I understood, yeah. yeah. Of, of the need that we, we have of, of, you know, in the context of adaptation at altitude of working more together between these uh, platform of socioecological indicators of the Andes that we try to generate and the indicators that you know that exist and that we could, you know, cut for the Andes and analyze at the Andean level at the national or subnational or continental level. So I, I think that's a big avenue for further work that we have in, in the program. Yeah, absolutely, it is, Daniel, and I, I did actually you had, I had this um, indicator platform on my radio and should really have, have mentioned it. Um, I think it's, again, if I understood correctly, it's more necessarily, or rather more aimed at sort of like uh, decision makers and things in the sense that it's one of these mm -hmm. like indicator platforms. And um, I was focusing a little bit more in my talk on, on um, actual you know, underlying data sets, I suppose. But yeah, this is definitely very, very relevant and of course covers many of these different themes which I've talked about today. And um, and again, yeah, I would encourage the participants to, 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 to look at that and also in particular the data sources which are used and, um, and you know, that can also help complement the list, uh, list which, we, which we will put together. And hopefully then this can feed back a little bit also into the Geo Mountains inventory and, and also into the local scale um, science and, uh, and applications. So yeah, in the remaining time, if we can, I wanted to, well, firstly, I set up this spreadsheet and I just put the link in the chat whereby if you are aware of other important data sets which either I didn't mention or I, we're not aware of, 
you could maybe um, just list the, the very basic information about them, such as the name, which variable is measured and, and the URL um, in, the, in the spreadsheet. Um, and then we can also maybe just have some more general discussion around some of these questions. I mean, we don't have to, to go from one to the next, but um, of course we've touched on some of the respective strengths and limitations of the various data sets, but it could be nice to go into detail um, on this. Um, what sort of potential concrete research directions or questions could we actually uh, seek to address, perhaps also extending beyond what will be done in the, in the course, um, uh, the, the in-person course in the coming weeks, which methods really can we uh, apply to also bridge these scales uh, and to go beyond uh, simply analyzing, analyzing trends and uh, trends at, at very local levels, um, which model types of modeling approaches can we use, statistical species distribution models, something more dynamic, something more process-based, machine learning. What are the potential challenges and limitations with, with these kind of approaches and any other thoughts, suggestions, ideas you have, things if you disagree with, with some of my suggestions, I'm happy to also debate. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to open up the floor firstly for contributions of data sets. Uh, they could be ones which you've developed yourselves or they could equally be ones which you're just aware of and have been developed in the broader community. And uh, then maybe, yeah, we can, can have some thoughts and, and discussion around some of these questions. Thank you uh, very much for your attention so far and I look forward to also hearing your insights uh, from, the, from the region. Thank you very much, James. It's been a great talk. Um, I think we now are going just to close um, this day. Eh, hemos terminado eh, con la exposición de James. Le estamos agradeciendo mucho por su participación. Eh, Quiero que sepan que vamos a poder compartir esta presentación en PDF. James nos la va a enviar luego y también estaremos subiendo a nuestro sitio web, como les hemos dicho, todos los recursos, los sitios web, las plataformas y los artículos que se han mencionado durante esta charla, pero también eh, en todas las otras charlas. Eh, antes eh, de despedir y, y de eh, cerrar este espacio, quisiera por favor eh, pedirles... Eh, que llenen una encuesta de retroalimentación. El link está ya en el chat de Zoom y lo pondremos también en nuestro Facebook para que las personas que nos ven por allí puedan también llenarlo. No les va a tomar más de tres minutos. Es una, un cuestionario muy cortito en donde queremos su eh, retroalimentación, sus comentarios para poder hacer mejor eh, y construir mejores webinars en el futuro con los temas eh, que son de interés de ustedes. Eh, Saskia. Sí. Eh, sí entiendo que James quería que dedicáramos un rato a, a contestar esas preguntas. Entonces, en el tiempo que tenemos, eh, por lo menos explorar algunas de las respuestas con la audiencia. Adelante, la audiencia está... Entonces, no sé si podemos volver a hacer las preguntas. James, can we please look at your um, discussion questions again? Please. Thank you. So yeah, I just wanted to comment that regarding the, 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 the potential data sets or, or monitoring network that, networks that are available, uh, we yesterday had a talk from, from Miren, uh, the, the exotic invasive species uh, network for mountains. And I think that's a very relevant uh, source of information that, that could be mapped uh, with Anibal Pauchar and, he, and the people who's working with him. And uh, maybe uh, Julieta or somebody from, from, from the uh, ER could talk a little bit about this survey of monitoring networks that, that we did with the uh, Adaptation and Altitude Program in the Andes, uh, in which they identified some 50 networks uh, operating in the Andes. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Uh, Yeah, I mean, of course, we're very much aware of, of Mirren. Um, and if the colleagues also want to, to fill in the spreadsheets or re respond to the other questions, then uh, that, they can do that also in the spreadsheets as well. Yeah. So I don't know if we have somebody from here that could comment a little bit about this inventory that you carried out.
Julieta, Julieta. <risa> eh, por ahí. Andaba conectada, no sé, no estamos juntos, al final se fue a la otra compu, pero no sé ahora si está, calculo que... O oh, Ezequiel. No worries, I mean, we can follow up, uh, follow up afterwards on that perhaps. Yeah, so I think that's another source of information that it's interesting. We send it to Mountain Research and Development, but it's, in, uh, it's under evaluation. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a, it's an inventory of, uh, yeah, they identified at least 50 monitoring networks at different scales across the Andes. So maybe there, there are some that you don't know about that have been mapped in that study. Yeah, it would be great to put these on our on our map and um, yeah, get an even richer overview of uh, yeah what really what measurements, uh, especially long term measurements, of course, are underway. Uh, in the meantime, I'm trying to add the 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 web page in the spreadsheet, but it's uh, I mean I can just only see it. I cannot uh, edit it there, so. I don't know if you need to give me access or something or give us access. Uh, I'll try, thanks. I'll try to change the access settings. Um, if not, we can also just use the chat as well. It's just- a... oh, okay, then, then it's completely fine. Thank you. Yeah, thanks and apologies. Does anybody else have any thoughts on, on what's been presented? Of course, it's a very challenging topic to try to bridge these uh, scale gaps, but um, maybe some of you have experience and, uh, uh, and methods and ideas on the data sets which can be useful and, and so forth. Uh, James, um, I think that you haven't mentioned the GBIF, have you? No, I haven't mentioned the, this is the Global Biodiversity Information Facility. That's right, yeah. Um, of course, this is a large global database. Um, yeah, I've, we've been in touch also with um, some of the colleagues there, and um, yeah, this is definitely something which we, which we support. I was, I suppose, focusing a little bit more on the, um, yeah, the vegetation and the forest um, side, but of course, there's a wealth of data there in that database, and maybe we can put the link in the chat uh, so that everybody's aware of of this. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really also, I think, alludes to the fact that there are really an explosion of these uh, databases and portals and inventories and, and indicator platforms. And actually, um, part of the challenge now for us as scientists and, and people trying to apply science for, for policy and decisions is actually trying to keep track of this. And so um, also that's a little bit where, where Geomountains comes in, acting on a level a little bit uh, above to try to sort of systemize um, all these different amazing, great resources and efforts which are which are out there, and um, again, think about how we can actually um, yeah, work uh, across them or in somehow integrate them into our workflows, and um, especially in a more more modern way. Of course, things like the Google Earth Engine are very promising for this. There are many data sets which are there, especially large data sets which we can analyze directly uh, on the cloud platform. Uh, without having to download a million different things ourselves and, uh, and deal with many different file formats and things in the in the more old-fashioned or traditional workflow, um, but yeah, it's still really a challenge to get these databases to, to to talk to one another and to be interoperable. At least in my experience, but at least as a first step, if we can try to to put on the table everything which we have, and then hopefully people can use the the most relevant data sets. Um, for a given application, rather than potentially something which is older, which they just know about, or they get to ask their, their colleague in the same institute what they used last time and things like this. Hopefully, and we can make this flow and chain of information a little bit, a bit smoother. Um, specifically in the context of the forest, uh, Andean forest and, 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 and Gloria Andes network, I think that one of the big, big open challenges, you know, we have the, the approach that has been used so far is to try to use species distributions to try to model their thermal niches. So once you know, you know, how wide or, or narrow is the thermal niche of the species, then you can go from that to a vulnerability uh, uh, developing, you know, weighted uh, mean scores for the communities of, of we, to which these species belong, because you know the abundance, and then you can see, well, you know, this community has this community weighted score for for for, for a niche trait, for example, temperature amplitude. 
Uh, but we haven't done anything about precipitation precisely because of the uncertainty with, with data about, about you know, how much it rains and how relevant that is for actual uh, water availability in the soil. So I think one big, big question uh, in which you can link uh, community data from both of these networks to global products is to try to get some understanding of, of, of what are the what is the role of changing precipitation on the on the vulnerability of these communities to climate change? And uh, so that's that's a big open question that we need to work, do more work about. And maybe there the, the experience that you have from in MRI in terms of you know dealing with the downscaling and with the, what's really available that is high quality uh, would be a very productive way forward. Very yeah, specific, but very productive. <laughs> Yeah, no, this sounds like a very interesting question. And I suppose it's about really going back to this discussion before about working out what, if any, properties or characteristics of these larger scale data sets are useful. Is the seasonal dynamic you know, reasonable or is the spatial pattern reasonable, even if the absolute values are not? And I suppose your question also alludes to the need for greater collaboration with hydrologists, for instance, and hydrogeologists, because, you know, Changing precipitation depending on the nature of the well, the topography and also the geology. Um, you know, you could have the same change in precipitation, which could lead to very different water availability conditions depending on the yeah, the topography and the geology, depending on the uh, the subsurface processes and the interactions and things like this. So, I mean, um, it's obviously a complex situation, but of course, we need to try to to integrate as many of these known covariates into the models because we you know we know that. You know, forests and plants depend on on water, but you know if they're not modeled in some way, then it's if this effect is not modeled, then it then it's um, kind of we're we're lagging behind a little bit perhaps. And yeah, I also wanted to talk a little bit more about these dynamic uh, species distribution models as well, because I'm I'm aware that most of the approaches traditionally are these correlative ones where we assume that the vegetation is in equilibrium, say with the climate, these envelope models, so to speak. But of course, in reality, like many species depend on there being sufficient soil and soil formation, for instance, in a deglaciating landscape is a very slow process. So it could be that um, based on the thermal niches, you know, you would say, okay, this, this plant species can colonize the higher elevations, but actually if there's no soil there, then, um, then, it, then it won't work, you know. And, um, so I think I'm just pointing to the kind of complexity and the need to also collaborate across different disciplines increasingly, and maybe also apply different or you know, different modeling approaches, statistical versus more process-based, um, where we're modeling, say, the dispersal or the effects of, um, of disturbances and, and this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, I think um, the more we can exchange across disciplines and also potentially across regions as well, the more we can do better to ensure that these known covariates are represented in, in our models in an appropriate way. But yeah, of course, it's dependent on the data, which is which is existing and the ways which we can exploit it uh, to, to answer some of these questions. But yeah, it's a very interesting area. So thanks a lot for this comment, uh, Luis Daniel. And I, I think another interesting comment, uh, point for Gloria is to try to understand previous uh, ice cover, uh, to try to understand how, you know, how much time after ice uh, retreated the community has been developed, you know, because most of these summits, especially the high elevation ones, Really, what you are observing is a primary succession dynamic. But that since we don't know how, how long ago the glacier was there, it's very difficult to understand the dynamics linking it to primary succession. So I think that's mm -hmm. a very old, uh, you know, trying to see if we can get a regional view of, of glacier extent in the past would be yeah. a very useful, uh, a very useful avenue of research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And of course, this is. This is uh, tackled in various different ways. You're looking at the dating of the moraines and things like this, and um, the ice cores, of course, as well. So this more paleo science or longer term uh, histories of ice uh, evolution. I think this is this is also very interesting. And yeah, I mean, geo mountains where possible. We're also trying to develop links with the paleo science community because mountains are often you know, instrumentally they're data poor, but actually in terms of paleo archives, they're often comparatively data rich because they're sort of depositional environments right we have um you know uh, lakes and, and wetlands and glaciers and so forth so in many ways uh, from paleo perspective at least uh, we have a lot of potential data for these longer term reconstructions in mountains and if you're interested anybody in this then we can also try to to build these bridges a little bit further and 
again, try to explore, for instance, can we confront the latest climate models with some of these paleo data on a very specific regional basis in mountains, because there's, this, again, the scale gap um, there. And that could, again, be a, a similar example of, of feeding um, local data into these uh, more global scale analyses and, and products. Ricardo? Yes, just a small addition there. Like following from my, from my talk a week ago, herbivory and livestock are very, very important sources of, of vegetation change. And I mean, it's perfectly okay and, and reasonable to, to think on climate change and hydrogeology and all the, the, the physical variables, but just, just to repeat the example that I gave uh, last week, in many mountains, you see an increase in one degree of temperature in 20% uh, more or less rainfall in the last 50 years. In the same periods, there are locations and, 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 and regions where you have seen a decrease in livestock of about 50%. And this is because we have data on livestock, but, but we also see huge changes in native herbivores because of diseases, because of changing in, in hunting pressure, because the, 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 the demography of this species that is, it, it includes a lot of variability. And my general sense is that we are not considering herbivory as, as an important source of, of variation that should be more seriously included in, in all these analyses. And, and thinking on, on databases, I think this is something that needs to be constructed. The, the, the changes in, 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 in Vicuñas, for example, in the, in the Andes have been huge in the last decades. So that's, that's another thing to, to consider. Yeah, I can only agree fully with what you're saying, Ricardo. I think it's really, of course, we need to stop thinking of mountains as these pristine systems, because most, you know, most, if not all, mountains are in some way affected to a greater or increasingly, well, to a greater degree um, through anthropogenic human activity and not think too narrowly in our disciplinary silos again, but also take a step back to what is the, what is the major driver in a, over a given time period in a given location? Is it climate? Is it this? Is it that? And so I can only agree with what you say. And I think building these databases it's essentially a bit equivalent also to the societal or it's a type of societal data or it's, a, it's equivalent to the, to the examples I gave about societal data as well, where often we're talking again about different types of data, which at least as physical scientists, we may be less um, used to working with. So it's about collaboration also with social scientists, with people, with you know, the people who look after these data. Um, but yeah, I think we absolutely have to avoid taking a very narrow disciplinary view of these problems and really, um, yeah, take a step back. And I mean, it's a, it's a similar case in, in what I was working in before, which is flood risk. And of course, there's a climate uh, impact there, but also the, the biggest impact is people just building stuff uh, in the floodplains and that really dwarfs any, any climate signal, at least in the near term. So it, that's kind of another example of where we actually have to look at the very big picture. Um, but I agree really with what you say, and uh, hopefully we can try to develop these, these databases also. Thank you. Algún comentario más? Any additional comment? I think we don't have more comments. So I think we will wrap up here this discussion. Thank you, James, again. And thank you for Geo Mountains for being part of uh, the organizations that uh, made possible this webinar. Muchas gracias a todas las organizaciones que han hecho posible este webinario. Antes de cerrar, eh, tenemos unas palabras eh, de despedida eh, de Luis Daniel Yambi y de Ricardo Grau. Eh, Luis Daniel, te dejo eh, la pantalla para que nos puedas hablar. Ya, yeah. eh, bueno, primero, thank you very much, James. It was, it was great having you here and having this discussion. Uh, I, I, need, I think we needed a lot more time to address all of these questions, but you know, this is an open line of, of work that we have together. So we will continue working on this. 
Uh, y bueno, eh, más en general sobre el, los seminarios, pues quería agradecerles muchísimo la participación de todos. Hemos tenido gente que ha estado eh, los seis días con nosotros, otros que han ido y venido. Ha sido una jornada larga. Y bueno, obviamente cada, la gente tiene miles de otras cosas que hacer, pero realmente hemos estado súper contentos con la participación. Hemos tenido días con muchísima gente, eh, estábamos muy sorprendidos. Y creo que eso nos hace pensar que este tipo de espacios en donde discutimos eh, los detalles eh, de lo que se está haciendo en investigación y tratamos de ponerlo en el contexto de, de por qué son relevantes para la toma de decisión, para, la, para el manejo, eh, para la, los análisis comparativos, para desarrollar una, una visión más continental de los problemas y de los impactos conjuntos del cambio climático y el uso de la tierra, eh, son espacios súper relevantes que tenemos que seguir generando, así que que quería solamente eh, confirmar que realmente quedamos súper entusiasmados todos los que participamos en la organización de estos espacios eh, y que esperamos poderlo seguir desarrollando. Ahí su feedback a través de la encuesta es muy importante para ver qué otros temas les parecen claves, qué les gustó de lo que hicimos esta semana. Eh, y bueno, y finalmente agradecer muchísimo a SAC, a Instituto de Ecología Regional, eh, y, a, y a todo el equipo por todo el trabajo que, que se ha hecho, eh, que está detrás de cámara, pero que ha sido muy importante, a Rafael Rodríguez también de Comunicaciones de Condesán, que nos ha acompañado todos los días. Eh, y, y nada, invitarlos a seguir eh, dándole vida a estos espacios, porque creo que esta, esta discusión a nivel continental sobre estos temas es súper importante que la sigamos manteniendo viva. Así que muchísimas gracias. Muchas gracias, Luis Daniel. And just from my side, thank you very much for the organization to Saskia and the colleagues in Condesan. I think it was great. I hope uh, at least maybe you found one or two new uh, potentially interesting data sets. And thanks to all, um, you know, from the MRI and from Jim Mountains. Thank you very much. Bueno, de mi parte, eh... No mucho que agregar, eh, repetir lo que, lo que enfatizó Luis Daniel, que hay un potencial de fortalecer mucho la, la, la comunidad de ecólogos y de socioecólogos de los Andes, que tenemos realmente mucho para, para compartir y aprender. Y cuando digo socioecólogos, también creo que identificamos entre todos que lo socio es algo que eh, estamos un poquito débil en comunicación, ¿no? Entonces, eh, tenemos que fortalecer los vínculos con las ciencias sociales, este, con los economistas, con los antropólogos, con los arqueólogos, de quienes tenemos algo para enseñarles y muchísimo para aprender. Así que yo personalmente me, me comprometo a empujar un poquito esa colaboración y tratar de involucrar a MRI y a Condesan en avanzar en esa dirección. Así que muchísimas, muchísimas gracias por sus aportes. Muchísimas gracias, Ricardo. De mi parte también quiero agradecer a todo el grupo organizador de este seminario web. Eh, estamos muy contentos de cómo han salido todas las charlas y de haber tenido una audiencia tan numerosa y tan participativa en estos seis días en los que nos hemos encontrado aquí virtualmente para discutir sobre los temas de dinámicas de la vegetación. No me quiero despedir eh, sin antes volver a compartir el sitio web. Está en pantalla ahora mismo, curso dinámicasvegetación.condesan.org, donde continuaremos subiendo información relevante a todas las charlas y conferencias que hemos tenido eh, en estas semanas. Y también les dejo ahí más abajo, capacitación arroba condesan.org, mi correo, por si tienen preguntas, sugerencias, comentarios, más allá de la encuesta que pedimos que, que llenen justamente para tener su retroalimentación y sus sugerencias para seguir eh, haciendo este tipo de espacios y seguir compartiendo información a nivel regional. Mi nombre es Saskia Flores, trabajo en Condesan y nos vemos la próxima. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Gracias, Sas. Saludos a todos.